Hello, I'm Father James Kubicki, the Director of the Apostleship of Prayer for the United States. And this is the second of our series going through the book that I wrote on the Sacred Heart of Jesus called A Heart on Fire, Rediscovering Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And hopefully as we present the different chapters of this book, and today we'll be looking at chapter three and chapter four, it will help you appreciate and understand a little more what I was trying to do with this book as you read it and pray about it and then discuss it amongst yourselves. So I'm very happy that you are taking this opportunity to use this book for your prayer. Recently, I heard that Bishop Olmsted of Phoenix sent out a tweet to all the people who subscribe to his Twitter account, and he invited them to be part of a reflection that he was doing with my book. Uh, during this season of Lent, he was going to go through different passages in my book and use them as a way of going deeper in our prayer lives during the season of Lent. One of the things that we do during Lent besides fasting and giving alms is to pray. And not just to say prayers, but to pray, to go deeper in our prayer life, our spiritual life. And as we have been saying, the deepest that we can go is to enter more deeply into the very interior, the heart of Jesus himself. And so today we'll be continuing our true love story, building on what we talked about last time, and also talking about the Eucharistic dimension of the Sacred Heart of Jesus devotion. Last week, we began reflecting on the true love story that the Sacred Heart of Jesus is. And we began talking about how this is really not our devotion, but God's devotion to us. And our devotion, any warmth, any love, any devotion that we have to God, to Jesus, is a response to God's initiative, to the fact that God has first loved us and shown us the greatest love possible by offering himself on the cross for our salvation. And so we will continue this story now by talking about how the Sacred Heart of Jesus has played a role in the life of the church since Jesus rose from the dead and since Pentecost. You know, one of the criticisms leveled against Catholics is that we go beyond the Bible. Uh, there are many of our brother and sister Christians who say, well, I'm a Bible-based Christian. I go only to the Bible and anything else is an addition that does not carry the same weight as the Bible does. And yet, when we look at how the Bible has led to so much controversy through the centuries, and you could say that all the many different denominations of Christians that have arisen through the centuries are a re result of different interpretations of the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, don't we need something more than the Bible itself? And in fact, St. Paul says the very same thing in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 15. In that letter, St. Paul is addressing himself to Timothy, and he's talking about what is the bulwark, what is the foundation of the truth. And I suspect that many people would say that the bulwark of the truth would be the Bible. But as we've said, the Bible has been interpreted in many different ways. The passage, by the way, is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And there, St. Paul says this, If I should be delayed, you should know how to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So St. Paul himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that the Bible is not the pillar and foundation of the truth, but the church is. The Bible came out of the church. There were many different gospels going around after the time of Jesus for the first couple of centuries, and it was the church in the 400s that decided 
the four canonical gospels, the four gospels that are approved as inspired by the Holy Spirit. There are many other gospels that were going around, but these are the ones that the church in a council inspired by the Holy Spirit decided were the inspired word of God. And so the Bible comes out of the church and the church with the help of the Holy Spirit interprets the Bible for us. And it's within the church that we can get a trusted and true and authentic interpretation of the Bible. The Second Vatican Council said this in the document on divine revelation. It said that there are two sources of revelation. Uh, one is the Word of God, the Scriptures, and the other is the Word of God present and active in the church with the Holy Spirit inspiring the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium, to interpret the scriptures authentically. So we can't just rely on the Bible for our faith. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us to all truth. And in fact, that's exactly what Jesus himself said. In the Last Supper, this is chapter 16 of John's Gospel, and we have that long section in John's Gospel of Jesus giving his farewell address to the apostles. And in chapter 16, Jesus talks to his apostles about his impending departure when he's going to be crucified, rise from the dead, ascend into heaven, and the church will be without him. And he says, it's better for me that I go because if I go, then I can send the Holy Spirit to you. And so in speaking to the um, apostles at the Last Supper, Jesus said this, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. Now, the church teaches that the, uh, that Jesus is the perfect revelation of God, that he is the word of God made flesh. We shouldn't be looking for any other kind of information, truth, revelation apart from Jesus Christ. And in fact, in my book, I, I quote this in this chapter, and this is from the Second Vatican Council, which in turn is quoted by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it states this, Christ, the Son of God made man, is the Father's one perfect and unsurpassable word. In him, God has said everything. There will be no other word than this one. So the revelations and the teaching of the church don't add anything to what Jesus has said, but they explain it further for us to understand. The Catechism uh, goes on to say this, yet, even if revelation is already complete, it has not been completely made explicit. It remains for Christian faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. This is the Holy Spirit guiding the church, but this is also Jesus from time to time coming to earth and speaking to us about his message. Let me ask you a question. What was the first recorded apparition of Jesus in history after he ascended into heaven? Now we're not talking about after he died and rose from the dead and then appeared to the apostles and to Mary Magdalene uh, and to 500 people as St. Paul says. What was the first recorded apparition of Jesus after he ascended to heaven and Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came upon the church. We actually have that in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 9, the Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, St. Paul talks about the first recorded apparition of Jesus, where Jesus appeared to him. Remember, he was Saul, his name was Saul, and he was a persecutor of the church. He was on his way to Damascus to round up Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem, to be imprisoned for the faith. And along the way to Damascus, St. Paul says that Jesus appeared to him, and it was a light that blinded him. And a voice said to him, Saul, Saul, 
Why are you persecuting me? Remember, Jesus didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting these followers of mine, my disciples? Jesus didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, this was a further explanation of something that Jesus had said earlier in the Gospels when he walked this earth. He told the story of the Last Judgment in Matthew chapter 25. Remember how the story goes? Jesus says that at the end of time, the King of Glory will come and he will separate people like sheep and goats. The sheep will enter the kingdom. The goats will be alienated from God forever. And the criteria for that judgment will be whatever these people did or did not do for the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. Whatever we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do for Christ. Jesus taught that, that he is one with his church, with his followers. He is one also with humanity because he took human nature upon himself. And in that way, the Second Vatican Council says, and this is in Gaudium et Spes, number 22, a favorite passage of St. John Paul's. He said that in a certain way, Jesus has united himself with every human being because he took on human nature. So whatever we do to other people, we do to Christ. That's what Jesus was further explaining to Saul. And later, Saul now becomes St. Paul, the greatest missionary of all times and great letter writer in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talks about what he learned from the voice of Jesus himself at this point. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul writes about how the church is one body and how Jesus is the head of the body and we are the parts of the body. And he goes on to say this, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. We are not isolated individuals, but we are united together in the body of Christ. And what we do affects not only ourselves, but others. That's why there is no personal sin that, well, I'm just hurting myself. No, as a member of the body of Christ, you are hurting the whole body. All it takes in the physical body is one cancer cell to run amok, to do its own will, and in that way, sicken the entire body. And the same is true for the body of Christ. We are united in this body. That's what Jesus was teaching Saul. Now that was Jesus' appearance, the first appearance of Jesus after he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. But from time to time, Jesus has appeared to various people, to different saints, to continue to explain to them things that perhaps had been forgotten or that needed greater emphasis in one way or another. One of these was in the 12th century to a Belgian nun by the name of Juliana of Liege. We now know her as Saint Juliana of Liege. And Jesus speaking to her said, I want a new feast, a feast in honor of my body and blood. What today we call Corpus Christi, the feast of the body, most precious holy body and blood of Jesus Christ. We celebrate this after uh, the Easter season. Jesus called for this feast at a time in history when many people had grown cold in their Eucharistic reverence and faith, and many people were no longer honoring our Lord in this blessed sacrament. So she called, uh, he called St. Juliana to speak with the Pope, have this feast established. Pope Urban IV did this. St. Thomas Aquinas was commissioned to write hymns, which we sing to this day. The Latin hymn, O Salutaris Hostia, Tantum Ergo, these go back to the 1200s when Jesus called for this feast to renew our Eucharistic faith. You see, he's not adding to his revelation, but he's helping us appreciate it in a deeper way and giving us a feast in order for us to do that. Well, 400 years go by 
and the world is still cold in its devotion to our Lord. And our Lord now comes to another sister, a visitation sister this time, in France, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. And he reveals himself to her in the context of the Blessed Sacrament. In other words, while she was adoring our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, exposed on the altar, or when she was praying in front of a tabernacle, Jesus began appearing to her. And he called for another feast, a feast that would be celebrated eight days after the Feast of Corpus Christi. Now, in those days, Corpus Christi was celebrated on a Thursday. Eight days later would be the Friday eight days after Corpus Christi. Today, in many places, including the United States, we celebrate the Feast of Corpus Christi on Sunday, and so the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is celebrated on the Friday after Corpus Christi. And the reason for the feast, Jesus told her, was, again, the coldness with which people treated him in the Blessed Sacrament. And he targeted, in particular, religious, consecrated persons and priests who ignored his presence, who treated him with a, a certain lack of reverence, and he called for a feast of reparation. Now, the word reparation, we'll be talking about this later in our little series, but it basically means to repair the damage, to make up for what is lacking. And so Jesus calls for this feast in honor of his sacred heart as a way of making up for the lack of devotion to his love revealed every time we celebrate Mass, and to our Lord present in the tabernacles of the world, and present in Eucharistic adoration. This was the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Notice, it didn't replace Corpus Christi, but it was a further development in this Eucharistic spirituality. And as you'll see as we go through our book, that the Sacred Heart devotion is a Eucharistic devotion. It's all about the Eucharist, and we'll say more about that as we go on. Now let's fast forward a few more centuries. We come to the 1930s. Jesus again appears, and he appears to another religious woman. Her name is Faustina Kowalska, a Polish nun in uh, Europe. And he appeared to her and had uh, an image. He said, I want an image of myself painted. And the image will be as you see me before you now. And from my heart come rays of white and red, representing the blood and water that flowed out from his heart on the cross. And these rays, Jesus told St. Faustina, represented baptism and the Eucharist, the source of our Christian life. And on the bottom of this painting, she was to put these words, Jesus, I trust in you. This is the beginning of what we know as divine mercy devotion. Uh, Jesus called for uh, the Sunday after the second Sunday of Easter to be, uh, excuse me, the Sunday after Easter to be called the Divine Mercy Sunday. It's the second Sunday of Easter. And to have a novena, prayed, and the chaplet of divine mercy. I'm sure you're familiar with these things. This did not replace Corpus Christi or the Sacred Heart Feast, nor did it replace devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and devotion to the Eucharist. But it was a further development of these devotions. In divine mercy, we honor Jesus as the heart of mercy in our world. A friend of mine, a Jesuit father, Father Mitch Pacwa, who many people watch on EWTN, once told me that Jesus appeared in the 1600s, which was a very cold time in human history. It was the beginning of the scientific age when people felt that the only thing that was knowable was what science could give us, and that was the only truth, and it was a very cold, analytical time. And in that time, Jesus appeared with a heart on fire with love, inviting our response, our devotion to him. Then, Father Pacwa told me that it was during the merciless century in human history, 
a century when more people were killed than at any other time in human history. It was during this merciless century that Jesus appeared to St. Faustina and revealed his heart as the source of divine mercy in our world. So you see how Jesus comes from time to time to meet us where we are in our need and in human history's need. And he reveals further what he taught when he walked this earth. Now, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself because I began talking about the 1200s. But in the first 1,000 years of the church's history after Jesus, we really don't get an explicit devotion to the heart of Jesus. However, we do get five elements that do show up later in Sacred Heart Devotion. You could say that our Lord was preparing the church, preparing us for this devotion with these five elements. And what are those five elements? I write about them in the book. They are, first of all, the Last Supper. Many will say this is the first Eucharist where Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. But what happened at the Last Supper also involved his heart. John, the apostle, went close to the heart of Jesus. He put his head on Jesus' chest and asked Jesus, who is it that will betray you? Theologians, saints, spiritual authors say that in this moment of drawing near to the heart of Jesus, John received two things. One, wisdom. The wisdom that shows up in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, which many will say has, has the great um, the theology, a very high theology, um, much more words from Jesus than we get in the other three Gospels. Um, and where did John get that wisdom? From the heart of Jesus. He also received courage, the courage that led him the next day to stand under the cross with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and three other women close to Jesus in his suffering. Wisdom and courage come right from the heart of Jesus. A second element that we see in the first thousand years as people reflect upon Jesus and this prepares for devotion to his heart is spiritual water. It goes back to the Old Testament where Moses struck a rock and water came out from that rock. Uh, Saint Justin Martyr, who was uh, the first a uh, post-biblical author, writer, to talk about the heart of Jesus said that Christians are formed from this rock who is Christ, and this rock is the heart of Jesus, and we are formed right out of that heart. And it's, again, that image of the heart as the source of spiritual water, baptism, that which makes us one with Jesus. And in John's Gospel, we get that in John chapter 7 where Jesus says this, he stood up and exclaimed, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. And then it says, he said this in reference to the spirit that would be given to people who believed in Jesus. And theologians have debated this when he says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Does the hymn refer to Jesus? And the answer is yes. Living water flows from within him, from his heart, to give life to the church. But those who drink of the Holy Spirit have living waters within them as well. So every member of the body of Christ has this living water of grace flowing within them that came right from the heart of Jesus. The second element that we have in this period of 1,000 years before uh, Jesus appears, uh, revealing his sacred heart, is Jesus as the bridegroom of the church. Um, the early church for the first 1,000 years took the Old Testament book, Song of Songs, a great love poem, to describe God's love for his people, and in particular, Jesus' love for the church. He is the bridegroom, the church is his bride, and each one of us as members of the church have Jesus as our spouse. 
a spousal relationship, which St. John Paul II talked about in what's come to be known as the theology of the body. And so you have Jesus as the bridegroom of the soul, desiring this intimate relationship with us. Fourthly, you see uh, an element in the early church, the first 1,000 years, of a call to console the heart of Jesus. That Jesus' heart continues to be hurt and broken. Now, we might say, well, Jesus is God. He's perfect. How can he experience suffering? He is the head of the body. Wherever the body suffers, remember St. Paul said, when one part suffers, the whole body suffers. Jesus, as part of the body, suffers with us and for us. He suffers for the coldness with which he is treated, knowing that if we turned to him and received his love, we would have all that we need that we would have the greatest love possible. And so it's as though Jesus is saying, you thirst for so much, I have what you need. Come to me. And as you come to me, I will console you. So consoling Jesus has this kind of mutual uh, effect. And the fifth element that we see in the first 1,000 years of the church is a growing devotion to the wounds of Jesus, uh, to the wounds in his hands, his crown of thorns, uh, the wound on his shoulder, but in particular, the wound in his heart, the pierced heart. And we see this in particular in St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi in the 1200s had a deep devotion to the passion of Jesus, to the wounds of Jesus, so much so that he received those wounds in his own body. Now, a very interesting thing, 400 years after St. Francis of Assisi, Jesus spoke to St. Margaret Mary, and this is prior to the time that he appeared to her, and he had this to say about St. Francis, and this was on October 4th, the feast of St. Francis. He said that the glory of this saint was greater than others because of, the, uh, and it was given as a reward because of his great love for the passion, a love which rendered him worthy of the sacred stigmata and made him one of the great favorites of Jesus' heart. This is what St. Margaret Mary writes in her autobiography. He was given to St. Margaret Mary as a special patron saint and guide during the time that Jesus appeared to her and she was rejected by her community and suffered. He was a special patron saint. And so all of these things, these five elements, lead up to the 1200s, where Jesus appears for the first time and shares his heart with people like St. Lutgard, um, with St. Joseph Herman, uh, a uh, Cistercian, excuse me, a Kamal Deliz, um priest. No, I, I'm getting this wrong. He was a member of the Norbertines, the Premonstratensian order. Um, they are out in California and in De Pere, Wisconsin. Not many people know about them, but they say that one of the first apparitions was to this Saint Herman Joseph, who wrote a hymn in honor of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. You can read about that in my book. And I end this chapter with prayers from the various saints. Now we come to chapter four. And as I said, the uh, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is a Eucharistic devotion. And when we think of the Eucharist, the Mass, we think of uh, the two parts of the Mass. The first part is the Liturgy of the Word. That's what we're going to be talking about this time. And in the next chapter, chapter 5, we'll be talking about the second part of the Mass, the Eucharistic sacrifice. But in the first part of the Mass, we hear the Word of God, and our hearts are to burn with love as we hear that word of God, preparing us for the second part of the Mass. And the story that we have that illustrates this is from Luke chapter 24, the story of the two disciples after Jesus rose from the dead on the road to Emmaus. Remember, they were downcast. Jesus walks with them. They don't recognize Jesus. Um, Jesus asks them what's wrong. They tell him about how they had hoped that this Jesus would be their great leader. Jesus explains the scriptures to them, how the Messiah of, the, of, of God was to suffer and die and in that way save the people. And later they come to Emmaus. They recognize Jesus as he breaks the bread. That's the second part of the mass, the breaking of the bread. 
and Jesus disappears. What prepared them to recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread? The Word. They said, did not our hearts burn within us as he explained the scriptures to us as we walked along the way? That's what the Word should be for us. An entree, a door that leads us more deeply into the heart of Jesus. Eucharistic devotion and devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus begins, I believe, with the Word. But this is a great challenge because many of us uh, were taught not to read the Bible, unfortunately. Um, many of us begin reading the Bible at the beginning and we get bogged down in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and we think, oh, I'll never get through this. Or many of us might think, well, I've read the Gospels and I hear them every Sunday. Why do I need to read them over and over again? Well, reading the Bible is unlike any other kind of reading. We open ourselves up to God's Word. And Christ, present in the Scriptures, is speaking to us when we prayerfully read the Scriptures. So we don't read the Scriptures, the New Testament, so much for information because we know what's in there. We've heard it before. But we read the Scriptures, the Gospels, for formation, to have our minds, our hearts, our attitudes, our values formed by the living word, by Jesus present in the scriptures. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, we read this, the letter to the Hebrews, the word of God is living and effective. Jesus is living and present in the scriptures. And St. Jerome, who translated the scriptures into the language of the people of his time, into Latin, said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So if we want a living and growing relationship with Jesus, we spend time with him in the scriptures. There are different ways of doing this. And in my book, I refer to something that uh, Pope Benedict wrote uh, in uh, a letter that came after a synod of bishops that talked about the place of the word of God in the life of the church and the mission of the church and the name of the uh, document is Dei Verbum, the Word of God. And, and he talks about what traditionally we have called Lexio Divina, divine reading, sacred reading. We open ourselves up to our Lord present. And he goes through several steps, and you can read about them in my book. One of the steps that I had never heard before, and it, it comes at the very end of our prayer period, Pope Benedict says that our Prayer really is not complete. Here's how he puts it. Um, we do well to remember that the process of Lexio Divina is not concluded until it arrives at action, which moves the believer to make his or her life a gift for others in charity. Now, this is the spirituality of the apostleship of prayer for which I am the director. In other words, that our prayer especially with the Word of God, moves us to live the Word we have heard. In other words, to make that Word flesh in our own lives and to live it. And it leads to action. And that action involves making an offering of ourselves, our whole day to the Lord, and living that offering that we've made, saying, Thy will be done at all times, every moment of my day. So that's where our prayer leads us, to action. This is one method, Lexio Divina. Let's go a little deeper. St. Francis of Assisi, our friend from the 1200s, you know, is famous for having the first ever living creche, living Christmas scene. Why did he do that? Why did he gather people and dress them like the shepherds of the time of Jesus, have a stable with real animals and their smell, with a tiny baby, and a mother and a father. Why did he do that and have the people then come and look at that on Christmas Eve? Because he wanted people not just to think about the gospel passage, but to experience it as though they were present there. They didn't have movies at that time to do that. So he had a living nativity scene with all the smells and sounds that would have been part of that first Christmas in order for people to not just think about 
the gospel, but to experience it on that deeper level, to go from the head to the heart. Now, 300 some years later, St. Ignatius Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, comes on the scene. And I think he takes that same inspiration that St. Francis had, that people need to go deeper and not just read the stories that we hear all the time in the scriptures, but to experience them on a deeper level. And the way that St. Ignatius proposed doing that was with the imagination. To not just think about the scene and read it, but to put ourselves in the scene and to imagine ourselves there at that first Christmas or as we walked with Jesus. Some people say, well, isn't that pure fantasy? Well, you know, the imagination is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us. It's through the imagination that inventors come up with new inventions that give us the beautiful technology that we have. It's through the imagination that uh, medical researchers come up with solutions to medical problems and diseases. It's through the imagination that artists create works of art. The imagination is a God-given gift that makes us like the Creator, God Himself. And so why not bring the imagination to our prayer and imagine the scene and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through our imagination so that we might go deeper. I propose that we go even deeper with the imagination and that we not just experience the scene as though we're present there, but to try to imagine what Jesus was like. What made him so attractive to people that crowds of people flocked to him? Oh, of course, he gave bread to people. There was a free meal involved that may have attracted some people. He was a great healer. Many people came with their sick looking for healing. But there was something very attractive about his teaching and his very person. What was that? Try to imagine what Jesus was like in your prayer as you read the Gospels. But then go even deeper and imagine what was moving his heart in the stories in the Gospel. His heart was moved with every human emotion that we experience. He got angry. We know how he threw people out of the temple. He was sad when people rejected him. He cried over Jerusalem. He was impatient. He said, how long must I put up with you people? How long will I be with you? He was happy. You have to imagine Jesus enjoying himself in the banquets that people threw for him. And certainly children would not have come near him if he looked mean all the time or sad all the time. Uh, children flocked to him. He was happy. He loved life. He was filled with joy. And his heart was moved with pity and compassion for people. We read that several times in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, chapter 14, chapter 15, we hear that Jesus' heart was moved with pity. You might ask yourself, what moves your heart with pity? What brings a lump to your throat and a tear to your eye? And imagine, if that's true for you, how much more true was it for Jesus, who feels all that we feel, but you could say with a divine intensity. So, one way that we practice devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus is to meet him in the word and to enter more deeply into his heart, the movements of his heart, what he thought, what he felt, what were his values, so that we can have a heart like his, that our hearts will be molded and formed by his words, by his attitudes, reactions, and feelings. That's our goal, that two hearts may beat as one, the sacred heart of Jesus and our own heart. And next time, we'll be talking more about that, how we not only have the word to form our minds and hearts, but the very heart of Jesus himself present in Holy Communion, in the Eucharist, and that when we receive him, we receive the new heart that was promised in the prophet Ezekiel, a new heart to transform our hearts. 
Until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.